Hi, this is Professor Cahan, and this is U.S. History 1301, American History to 1877. This is Lecture 4, The English and New World Colonies. The first place we need to understand if we're going to, under, if we're going to see how the United States came into being uh, from the perspective of the British colonial experience, uh, we need to look at Virginia uh, as a as as a place uh, of how this cultural phenomena of uh, English colonization began. Uh, Virginians are critical uh, to the foundation of what becomes the United States, and there's very simple reasons why. It's a Virginian who is going to write the Declaration of Independence with the promise that quote all men are created equal. Now, at the time that that Virginian wrote those words and said that all men are created equally and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that same Virginian was personally depriving people of those same liberties. He owned 200 slaves at the moment that he wrote those words. Another Virginian, George Washington, uh, was leading the Revolutionary War Army during the Continental Congress that decided whether... Uh, the colonies would separate from Great Britain in the first place. Washington attended those meetings in his Virginia militia uniform uh, and rose to say that, quote, England is threatening to reduce the colonists to slavery. He said this again while personally reducing 277 people of African descent to slavery himself. The hypocrisy of these words is widespread. Over the course of this colonial era, there was only one colony, that was the colony of Georgia, that even so much as attempted to ban the institution of slavery. Slavery is critically connected to American ideas and ideals about liberty. These two ideas, slavery and liberty, rise in conjunction with one another. Uh, and for those of you interested in this sort of trivia, Georgia tried to ban slavery not out of some sense that slavery is immoral or anything like that. Georgia was simply initially established as a penal colony, and the thought was, why would a bunch of convicts who are being sentenced to live the remainder of their lives in Georgia, why would they need slaves? So since it's a penal colony, since it's essentially a prison, why give them slavery? But uh, as it turned out over the, in, uh, over the ensuing years, uh, Georgia had uh, more resources than the original founders thought, uh, Georgians turned to the same sorts of agricultural pursuits as other Southerners did, and Georgians wound up adopting slavery. But they were the only, com the only colony that even attempted to ban slavery. Now, the first place England actually tried to colonize was not even in the Americas. Uh, the first place they tried to colonize was actually Ireland. Now, you should know uh, how close Ireland actually is to England. Uh, but if you don't, there's a map on the board to give you an idea of how close it is. Uh, England called this, quote, an island on the Virginia Sea. So this area that's referred to as the Irish Sea between uh, England and Ireland, uh, England called that the Virginia Sea. Uh, a guy named Walter Raleigh led the effort to colonize in Ireland. He built a 42,000-acre estate or plantation as these estates were called during this era, populated by English settlers. Now, as you might imagine, the Irish were not particularly happy about this uh, happening. They rebelled about this, and England responded with violence. They viewed the Irish as, quote-unquote, wild animals. They talked about them in print as people who should, quote, or, quote, should be killed. They viewed the Irish very much in the same way that they would view Native Americans, uh, within the next 30 years in North America. The English at, uh, at Raleigh's plantation established a settlement scheme that was called plantation settlement. Very simply, what plantation settlement is, plantation settlement does not have an agricultural connotation. What plantation settlement means is the removal of a native population and then the replacement of that native population with English and Scottish nobility. So the removal of a, an, of a native population and the replacement of the native population with 
English and Scottish settlers. So under this plant, this plantation settlement scheme, it meant destruction of the indigenous population. In this case, the indigenous population is the Irish population. The Irish began revolting against this sort of stuff, uh, and it kind of culminated in this massive rebellion in 1641 that wound up being put down incredibly brutally by the English army. They sent this massive army into Ireland, uh, arrested thousands of people, literally thousands of people. They sold 30,000 Irish people into slavery in Russia and the West Indies, and they also killed thousands of Irish people. Uh, it's at the same time that England is doing all of this stuff in Ireland that they conclude plantation settlement is viable and it works. It helps establish a, a group of people uh, as colonists in a region. It helps us exploit resources as they saw it. So since it was successful in Ireland, or at least as successful as they saw it, they decided they were going to do this elsewhere. So the plantation settlement that happens in Ireland is very much a dress rehearsal for what happens in North America. Now, in 1607, the English land off the coastline of present-day Virginia. There was a landing party of approximately 20 or 30 men off of the, uh, the vessel. They started heading inland, and almost immediately, these English uh, soldiers got attacked by Native Americans. They floated around the Chesapeake Bay for the next three weeks, doing the same thing over and over and over again. They'd find a place to anchor. They'd send a landing party. The landing party would get attacked. They'd scurry back to the boats. They'd find a new landing spot, send the landing party out. They'd get attacked. They'd come back to the boats. Finally, after approximately three weeks, they found a peninsula that was dominated by a swamp, and they settled in this area, and they named it after the King of England, James II. They called this settlement Jamestown. Now, despite the memory that's handed down in popular literature and popular culture, especially kind of pushed forward by companies like uh, the Walt Disney Corporation, Jamestown is not a successful plantation. It's not a successful settlement. It is the story at Jamestown of one disaster after another. After three years in Jamestown, there was an uneasy truce that had developed between the Indians and the English. The English were getting corn from the indigenous population uh, surrounding Jamestown. And that corn that they were getting from these Indians was their sole source of food. These English people, bear in mind, had guns. They had forests that surrounded them that were full of wild game. They had streams full of fish. If they looked off into the coast uh, or onto the coast, they had an ocean full of fish that they could have uh, they could have uh, utilized. But absent that corn from Native Americans, they were starving. And by the spring of 1611, starvation was so bad that the original population of 500 dropped to 60 people by the spring of 1611. In 1611... In that spring, that population was replenished. A new ship started arriving, or new ships started arriving. New settlers got off of those boats. They came with more supplies for the settlement, but these same people, this and this new uh, addition, still grew no corn. The Native Americans taught them; they showed them how to grow corn, and these people simply refused to do it. One observer, one of the uh, people who sailed to Jamestown and then uh, because it was his job, uh, because it was his job, he wasn't planning to stay. He got back on the boat and wrote on his diary or in his diary that, quote, at the same time, the men cannot bring themselves to grow food. They spend their days at leisure bowling in the streets. These people Absent corn that they're getting from the Indians are going to starve to death. And they flat out refuse to do anything but engage in leisure activity. Uh, these people are 
in every way dependent on the Native Americans. So, of course, what they decided to do, uh, how they settled their problems, they simply attacked Native Americans. And this is uh, an instructive case about how the uh, Virginia settlers viewed the Native Americans. The leader, the uh, one of the lieutenants of the Virginia militia was a man named George Percy. And he wrote in his journal of orders that he attacked an Indian village with the plan of extracting corn from these Indians. And then he writes as follows. And this is a direct quote from his journal. Quote, my lieutenant brought with him the queen and her children and one Indian, Indian prisoner for which I taxed him because he had spared them. So before we move on, let's unpack that for a second. His lieutenant, one of Percy's subordinates, brought with him the wife of the Indian leader and her children, and then brought another Indian along with him. And because that guy brought a prisoner instead of killing the Indian, George Percy taxed him. I taxed him because he had spared them. His answer was, here's why I did all of this. His answer was that having them now in custody, I might do with them what I pleased. Now, George Percy is second in command, so he's very high up in all of this, and he continues in his journal, it was agreed upon to put the children to death, which was affected by throwing them overboard, shooting out their brains in the water. So it's no wonder that Native Americans and the people in Jamestown had a very touchy relationship with one another. They were not friendly with one another. They were constantly on edge with one another because of things like this. Okay? Native Americans were giving them corn, and the English were resorting to stuff like this in response. By 1612, some new things were, were happening. By 1612, the colonial government in Virginia, it had been there for five years now, the colonial government was doling out some punishments to the colonists. Some of these colonists were hanged. Some of them were stretched on torture racks. Some of them were put before firing squads. And their crime was that they were running away to live with Indians. And it should not surprise you again to find out that the reason they're running away to live with Indians is because these colonists who still refuse to grow food know that the only people who actually have food are the Indians. So they're choosing to risk going out to the Indians to try to get corn as opposed to starving to death in places like Jamestown. Now, why, after five years, do these people still have no ability to feed themselves? Well, one reason should be obvious, again, is bad leadership. Guys like George Percy are typical. So that even when they were actually getting food from the Indians, their leadership hampered those efforts. When you kill these Native Americans or you kill their wives and their children as a way to extract food from them, they're not going to be particularly interested in helping you out. Uh, on top of this, these tactics would evolve over time to that by the later 1600s, what these people would do is they would, these leaders would do is they'd trade infected blankets, blankets that had people uh, who had had cholera sleeping in them or people who had been affected by smallpox sleeping in them. And then they'd take those, ma those, uh, those blankets and trade them to Indians. They'd go out and say, we're here in a gesture of goodwill. Here's some blankets. Uh, we'd like to trade these in return for food. And then the Indians would take these blankets. They'd get sick and then they'd get wiped out as a consequence of it. So the, the leadership is terrible in Virginia. Uh, one of their only leaders who was actually effective, oddly enough, was a guy named John Smith. When John Smith stepped foot in Virginia, he came to the conclusion that without the Indians, without trading relations, without at least good trading relations with the Indians, Virginians are going to starve. So he made agreements with the Indians uh, for, to trade for food and all of this sort of stuff. As a consequence, the Indians allowed them to move out of this swampy area and into an area where there was cleaner water, where there was actually the ability to grow crops. And Virginians responded 
by demanding that John Smith be sent home. That John Smith be sent home. And we'll, I'll explain why in a couple of seconds here, why they want him to go home. A second problem in Virginia, in addition to the bad leadership, so it starts at the top, but another problem is the people who actually go to Virginia, who settle in Virginia. Those who went to Virginia on those initial voyages were the younger sons of the nobility and uh, the servants of those sons of the nobility. Now, England, during this period, had a series of laws that were referred to as primogeniture. Primogeniture. Now, what happened under primogeniture was is that the estates of a, of a man would pass down in total to his oldest son. So his oldest son would inherit everything that the father actually owned when the father died. This meant that younger sons of the nobility were going to have to find their way once their father died. Their fathers, most of the time, took care of them until he died, but once he was gone, they were kind of on their own. So these older sons, they were set. They got land, they got titles, they got money. But if a guy had a second son, typically what would happen is he'd pay for a commission in the military for that son so that that son would be set for life. He could go, he'd have an, a career in the military, he'd make money. It would be an entree to him to be able to get uh, land and titles. If he had a third son, he might pay for he might pay for another commission in the military, or he might send him to divinity school so that he could become a, an Anglican priest. But if he had a fourth son, this is an expensive proposition to keep doing over and over and over and over again. So if he had a fourth son, it was likely that that nobleman was going to tell his fourth son, look, I don't have anything that I can actually do for you. I can give you your name, but that's about it. So you're going to have to figure out how to make your own wealth in this world. So those third and fourth sons typically were the ones who would migrate to North America as settlers. Now, when they get to North America, their plan is to do exactly what the Spanish had done. The Spanish get into North America. They exploit Native Americans. They exploit the resource, uh, the resources. They find gold, silver, gems. They wind up using that and turning that into wealth and going back home and getting land and title. So these younger sons of the nobility had the same idea. They were going to come here. They're going to find gold. They're going to find silver. They're going to find gemstones. This will. They're not planning to stay. They're not going to stay in Virginia. They're going to take that stuff, and then they're going to go home and become the landed gentry there. So those are the people who are going. And then, of course, their servants. Their servants are people like butlers and footmen, uh, the people who wait hand and foot on them, hence the term footman, they're coming. And then there are a few artisans who come. And look at the type of artisans who come, perfume makers, goldsmiths, people who are going to be making luxury goods that these uh, from the raw materials that these people actually find. But there's one group that is absolutely not coming to Jamestown in these early days. Between 1607 and and 1620, there is still not one farmer migrating to Virginia. It's all these people of the nobility and their servants. Now, during this period, this is when John Smith was actually in charge as governor of the colony, a law got passed where everybody was required to do some work. Since John Smith had done all of this hard work in negotiating to get food from Native Americans, and it was going to have to feed everybody in the colony, what John Smith did was he put in place a law that said, you can get food from the colonial leadership, but you have to do some work every day in order to get it. So you have to go out and you, you're you going to have to fix the, you know, make sure the fence around the, uh, around the quote, plantation is fixed. Or you're going to have to join the colonial militia and spend some time doing stuff in the colonial militia. Or you're going to have to clean. Or you're going to have to do, you know, something. You're going to have to work in order to get food. And you have to work at least two hours every day in order to get food. So let's kind of backtrack to lecture three for a second. 
and think about what was going on in England at that moment. In England, they're passing laws that require the poor to work to sustain the economic viability of the nation, right? They're saying, we want all poor people working to contribute to the wealth of the country. But here in their colony in Virginia, you've got the nobility being subject to laws that say, you must work or you will not eat. So they're resorting to these laws for two, these required work laws for two different purposes. One, to enhance the state, but one, to say, look, if you don't work, you're going to starve to death. And people were angry about this. People were furious that this guy, John Smith, who was not a nobleman, who all he was was a soldier of fortune, they were angry that this guy who was beneath them, as they saw it, was telling them this is how it's going to be. So they demanded that he be recalled to England, and that's what wound up happening. He wound up going home to England. Now, it was pretty clear watching all of this stuff happen. It was obvious to everyone that English colonization in the New World had been a disaster and more likely than not, a mistake. There had been a previous colony attempted at Roanoke in present-day uh, North Carolina. That had failed. It had basically been wiped off the uh, wiped off the map. Jamestown was the successor. It was no more successful uh, than uh, Roanoke was. A, the only difference was is that it hadn't completely disappeared yet. So it appeared that England was on the verge of just saying, that's it. No more colonies. We can't figure out how to do it. So that's it. So it's at this moment that something changes. England might have stopped the colonial experiment, if not for one quick adaptation. A guy named John Rolfe, R-O-L-F-E, learned about tobacco cultivation. And oddly enough, he learned about tobacco cultivation from his wife, a Native American named Pocahontas. So Pocahontas does actually play a role in the development of colonial Virginia, but not the role that we think she did. She taught her husband, John Rolfe, about tobacco, and Rolf started growing this tobacco. He started distributing it to people in the colony, and then uh, it wound up making its way back to England. And people loved this grade of tobacco. They liked what was what uh, what it could do in terms of drying out the lungs, in terms of creating uh, stamina for workers. So they liked this so much that England said, "We'll continue the colonial experiment if you devote yourself." to growing tobacco. So now they've got something that will be a cash crop that will wind up providing wealth to the English colony. So this tobacco quite literally saves the life of the colony. It literally saves the colony. Even though today we look at tobacco and say it kills millions of people, it's this horrible thing, it literally is responsible for saving the colonial experiment in Virginia. Now I'm going to take us down a little side path here uh, and talk about Pocahontas for a second. Pocahontas did not have any sort of uh, a relationship uh, with people like John Smith. Uh, the narrative of Pocahontas, especially as seen in the Disney movie, was that uh, John Smith was on the verge of being executed by her father, King Powhatan, uh, that, he, uh, that she threw her body over his uh, and saved his life and thus Powhatan gained all gained some sort of wisdom and said, okay, we're all in this together. I can't kill our white brethren. And that's not exactly what happened here. What, exa uh, what exactly happened, obviously nobody knows. But what we do know about John Smith is that John Smith was well known for exaggerating things that happened. His is the only actual written account of the Pocahontas story. And John Smith, in his narrative, talks about how Pocahontas was approximately 11 years old. Uh, so there's no way that they were actually engaged in any sort of relationship, because even saying, well, it's a different time and a different era, nobody would have looked at John Smith, who was 40 years old, and said, yeah, it's perfectly okay for him to have this relationship with this 11-year-old girl. So just it did not happen that way. On top of that, what played out, even if Pocahontas did throw herself uh, 
over John Smith's body and beg for him to be spared. What was likely playing out was a ritual adoption, that by her doing this, her, essentially her father used her, Paul, Paul Hatton used her. By her throwing herself over that body and saying, please don't kill him, what she did was essentially allow Paul Hatton to step in and say, okay, this man is now going to be adopted by us. He's going to be part of our group, but more specific to that, he's going to essentially be a son of Powhatan, an adopted son of Powhatan. Now, why this matters, Powhatan had a very distinct view of these English colonists. He said, they're, trans, they're, they're trespassing on my land. So if anybody's going to be in charge around here, it's going to be me. It's going to be those English settlers swearing an allegiance to me, not me swearing an allegiance to them and their king back home in England. So uh, Paul, uh, Paul Hatton had a pretty sizable empire, and the way he ruled all of these different groups around Virginia was by having one of his own family members in charge in these areas. So he, did, he obviously didn't have an English son, so it was necessary for him to adopt John Smith. Now, how we know that part? Because John Smith himself talked about that sort of stuff. Uh, he played out these narratives where a leader would uh, adopt him because his daughter had done something similar to uh, Pocahontas. He wrote this in his diaries on two other occasions. Uh, so there's a pretty good chance, uh, I'd say a better than 99.99999% chance, that John Smith made all of this stuff about Pocahontas and his relationship up. However, Pocahontas is still a critical part of our narrative in terms of getting us to the colonial United States. When she turned 18, Pocahontas was actually abducted by the English in Jamestown and wound up being held prisoner for about a year on an English ship where she was indoctrinated, she was converted to Christianity forcibly, and then ultimately she wound up meeting John Rolfe and marrying him and then teaching him about tobacco. Now these English colonists still have a problem. John Rolfe may have taught them about tobacco and they may now have their cash crop, but the problem here is, is that the people who are coming people who came to Jamestown were nobility. They were gentlemen. And if you remember from lecture three, people of gentle means, gentlemen do not work. It doesn't matter if they've got their cash crop. It doesn't matter if they know this is going to make them a lot of money. They are still not going to be doing the work. So they still need a labor force. And as it turns out, there's a ready-made labor force back home in England. Now, to be fair and to be clear, there are a handful of slaves in Virginia. There were about 20 slaves who made it to Virginia in 1619. But again, that's only 20 people. They were not going to be the bulk of the workforce. England had a ready-made workforce back at home for labor in the colonies. And literally, all somebody had to do, they set up a whole system where you've got agents back home who communicate with people in Virginia to say, how many laborers do you need? We'll find you the number and we'll get them out there. All a person had to do was get a message back home to one of these agents and say they needed laborers, and laborers would be put on ships and sent back. This system worked out because there were lots and lots of destitute people in England who were looking for a fresh start. They knew nothing good for them was going to happen in England. They were never going to ascend in England. However, they could change their lives in a very meaningful way if they were able to get to the new world. So, But they couldn't afford to get to the new world. So these two things worked together. The system is called indentured servitude. Those indentured servants were often, not exclusively, but often, white English laborers who sold their labor in return for passage to Virginia. This indentured servitude is the dominant form of labor in Virginia for about the next 50 years. And why indentured servitude is the dominant form of labor and not slavery, 
boils down to a simple answer of money. The average life expectancy upon arrival in Virginia was five years. That means if a person made it to Virginia, they could reasonably be expected to live for another five years. Indentured servants cost approximately half of what an enslaved person cost during this period. So it made financial sense for these English people to buy indentured servants as opposed to enslaved peoples because their rationale, very simple. If I'm only going to get five years of labor, it doesn't make sense to pay a premium to pay for a, quote, lifetime of labor and own a slave when you can get the same five years of labor out of an indentured servant. So it's a strictly financial decision as to why there's indentured servitude and not slavery at this point. But this is still an important step in the evolution of labor in the new world. Virginians are setting up a system of labor that commodifies people, that commodifies the worker themselves. Now, what I mean by that, think about how we all work today. And I'm presuming most of you actually have a job outside of class, that this isn't the only thing you do. If you don't, uh, just try to follow along. Uh, but today, the laborer, the worker, is not what's commodified. It's the work that they do that is commodified. You're paid based on what your employer thinks the value of your work is, not what you, quote unquote, are worth. Okay, So the labor, the work, is commodified today, not the worker, not the laborer. But here, with indentured servitude and later on with slavery, the worker is commodified. The work is the work. The work is going to get done regardless. It's the worker, the laborer, the person doing the labor that is commodified. Okay, So whether it's an indentured servant or whether it's an enslaved person, those people who are doing the work do not actually own themselves and they don't own the, per the, uh, the conditions of their work. So this is a very important step in labor in Virginia. The reality here is that these indentured servants, whether they are English citizens or not, whether they theoretically have rights that no slave would ever have, the reality is, is that these are still coerced laborers. And in many cases, these coerced laborers had it as bad uh, as the enslaved people later on. For example, the punishment of indentured servants, just like the punishment of enslaved people, frequently involved physical torture and, vi and violence. Uh, two particular examples stand out for historians, uh, the cases of Elias Hinton and Elizabeth Abbott, both of whom were indentured servants. Elizabeth Abbott was examined by a neighbor. She had run away from the plantation she worked at. She had finally taken so much that she said, I can't take any more, and she ran away. When she appeared at the home of one of the neighboring plantations, uh, this neighbor discovered that Elizabeth Abbott had been beaten with a lash more than 500 times, that she had had 500 separate open wounds on her back. She was practically unconscious. She was bloody. She was dazed. And it took quite a while for her to recover. This guy happened to be a doctor and cleaned her up and all of this sort of stuff. But to give you an idea of how these people approached all of this stuff, after she was cleaned up, after she became conscious and lucid, this person, this doctor, told her that she should, quote, return to your master and pray that he forgives you for running away. Okay? The point was, he saw this violence. This guy saw the violence. He understood the violence and basically said, well, you must have done something to deserve that beating. You better go and beg for forgiveness. Uh, Elias, Elias Hinton was quite literally murdered by his uh, the owner of his term of indenture. Uh, Elias Hinton was the type of worker uh, who tried to drag out tasks and all of that. Uh, and so he was very uh, famous, quote unquote, for breaking his tools. One day, his owner came out of the house, saw that the tools were broken, picked up a rake, and beat Hinton to death with it. And when he was when he was brought to local authorities and told to an that he was going to have to answer for all of this, or answer to all of this, he said, "Look, he was, you know, he was he he behaved uh, 
poorly throughout the entirety of his term of service here. He broke tools. He disobeyed orders. He disobeyed the rules. Ultimately, I had no choice here. And the courts said, that makes sense. Go ahead. Go home. And so they didn't even charge the guy. They didn't let alone convict him or anything. They didn't even charge the guy. On top of this, on top of the physical punishment aspect, indentured servants could be sold. Their contracts could be sold. They could be leased. They could be punished at the whim of the owner. Uh, again, there's something different about this. We don't want to call this the precursor to slavery or early slavery because, again, the indenture, the term of indenture, is a contract. Okay? Slaves are not under contracts. There are not obligations that the, quote, owner has to meet. Uh, in, uh, otherwise, the contract gets voided. Okay? These indentured servants theoretically have rights under those contracts and have rights as English citizens. Uh, so there's, there's a very distinct difference between indentured servitude and slavery. But around 1640, the situation in Virginia started to devolve, and it devolved very badly. The economy started to collapse in Virginia because they started growing too much tobacco. They were growing tobacco everywhere they possibly could. And what this does is this is a simple supply and demand question. As the supply of tobacco continued to go up, the value of tobacco continued to go down. Now, the taxes that these people owe do not change. They still have to say, pay the same amount of taxes to the British, to the English government. So they've got a real problem with those, uh, those values going down because that means their revenue streams go down. They don't have the money anymore to pay these taxes. On top of this, beginning in the 1640s, more and more people were living through their term of indenture. Remember, the original terms of indenture were between four and seven years. Generally speaking, the thought was a person will not live through their term of indenture. So at least initially, these people got what were called freedom dues. And those freedom dues were things like land, a small amount of tobacco, some corn, some clothing, some tools, so that if they live through their term of indenture, they can go out, they, be, they can become productive members of society. Now, that's all well and good. But when more and more people start living through their term of indenture, they're going to go out, they're going to take their land, and they're going to also grow tobacco, just like everybody else is, because tobacco is the cash crop. So these indenture, these former indentured servants, who are now called freedmen, when they start growing tobacco, it exacerbates that problem of more tobacco, thus the supply continues to go up, and the values go down even further. So Virginians are looking at this and going, we have to do something. We cannot continue the way we are. And Virginians took a kind of a standard tactic here when they looked at the economy and said, it's all collapsing around us, what do we do? Virginians, the, the leadership in Virginia said, fine. The answer here is we squeeze labor. Okay, we squeeze labor. And here's how they do it. First, they try, it fails dramatically. They try to increase the term of indenture to seven years. And what the agents back home in England tell them is nobody is willing to sign up for a term of indenture of seven years. So you guys got to stop this. It's not going to work. What they settle on is changing the term of indenture to a system based on age. And they say that all people who are indentured servants will serve a minimum term of indenture of five years. So if you're a 21-year-old and you say, hey, you know, selling myself into indentured servitude for the trip to America sounds pretty good. Sign me up. That person will become free at 26. They have to serve a minimum of five years. So if they're over the age of 19, they serve an indenture of five years. But if a person's under the age of 19, that person who's under the age of 19 serves an indenture 
of 24 or until they are the age of 24. So if you're a 19 year old, you're going to be 24 when you get done. When if you're 18, you're going to be 24. You've served six years instead of five years. So you can probably guess this, what's coming next. What these people who want indentured servants are going to do is they're going to start telling the agents, the younger, the better. Because if they can get younger indentured servants, for example, if instead of a 20-year-old or a 21-year-old or a 19-year-old, if that farmer, that plantation owner, can get a 15-year-old indentured servant, then they will get nine years of labor. A 14-year-old, they'll get 10 years. And we notice that starting in the 1640s, historians noticed that the age of indentured servants starts going down and down and down. And we start seeing 10 and 11-year-olds being sold into indentured servitude. The other thing that these leaders in Virginia are also going to do is they're going to start eliminating land as part of the freedom due. They're going to say, when you become a freedman, you know, if you finish your term of indenture, you're still going to become a freedman, but we're not giving you land anymore. And ultimately, by the time the 1660s roll around, the freedom due, as it's called, is, six, is three barrels of corn and a suit of clothes. And that's it. Now, the problem here is that these freedmen need jobs. They need land. And the Virginia elite are telling them, no, you can't have any land. You're going to have to go out and figure out where to get land on your own. you got to do it yourself. So what these freedmen do is they start moving further and further west in Virginia. And this creates a problem because the further west they actually get, they start running into Indian tribes. These Native Americans have already left the eastern parts of Virginia because they don't want to deal with the Virginia colonists. So they've voluntarily moved westward. But now you've got these freedmen who are saying, well, if, if we want land, we've been told we have to go west. So they run into the Indians and the Indians are going, no, 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 no. We don't want you guys here. So you've got a clash again. And so these freedmen start petitioning the government and saying, look, we're out here trying to establish land claims like you told us to do, and we're getting killed by these Indians. You've got to do something to protect us. And the government in Virginia says, not our problem. We just told you to go out there and find land. We didn't tell you to go out there and fight with the Indians. So... People in the West are angry. They're demanding that the government do something. And there's a clash here. There's a, uh, there's a crisis where the people want one thing, the average everyday Virginian, those freedmen, they want something. And the elites in Virginia, the plantation owners, the landholders, don't want to give this to them. So there's inevitably going to be some sort of a clash developing. And that these people, these elites within Virginia, wind up living in constant fear of what happens if these freedmen, this growing number of freedmen, by the way, what happens if they wind up taking matters into their own hands? So starting in this period, this 1660s period, these people in Virginia are terrified that the indentured servants, the freedmen, are all someday going to rise up against them. There is absolutely class warfare developing in Virginia during this time. So these people are living in constant fear of it, and their fears are finally realized in 1675 and 1676. And in 1675 and 76, there's a rebellion in Virginia called Bacon's Rebellion, and you need to know about it for the exam. Bacon's Rebellion was actually led by a nobleman named Nathaniel Bacon, pictured here on the board. And it was a very odd rebellion. Nathaniel Bacon happened to be, uh, again, he was a member of the nobility, but he was sympathetic to the cause of those freedmen out in the West. He believed that if we, quote unquote, are going to tell them to go West, then we're under an obligation to protect them from the Indians. So what Bacon asked for was he asked for a license or permission to go out and fight the Indians. Now, in Virginia during this period, there was a sort of, again, an uneasy peace 
between the Indians and Virginians. And that's because the Native Americans had moved west and the Virginians said, if you move beyond this point, we'll leave you alone. They also put in place in Virginia's colonial legislature, they put in place a law that said, you're not allowed to go out and fight Indians unless you have a really, really, really good reason for it. There has to be something truly compelling for us to give you a, quote, license to carry out a fight against Indians. And when Nathaniel Bacon says, look, all these frontiersmen are being killed. We need to protect them. I want to raise an army and go out west, defeat the Indians so that we open up all of this land. The government looks at that and says, mm, no, that's not compelling enough. We're denying your permit. We're denying permission for this. Now, the governor of Virginia was a cousin of Nathaniel Bacon's. I'm going to come back to this slide for a second, but I want you to see the guy's face. The guy was a cousin of Nathaniel Bacon named uh, named William Berkeley. And Berkeley, as 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 Bacon saw it, Berkeley was personally responsible for stopping Nathaniel Bacon from getting this license. So he loses this bid. He loses his uh, uh, application for a license. But when the government says, no, you can't do this, Bacon says, I don't care. I'm going to go out and I'm going to do it anyway. So Bacon raises his forces, starts heading out. William Berkeley tells him that if you do this, you're going to be in violation of Virginia law and you're going to be subject to all sorts of penalties and punishments, including arrest and potentially being convicted of treason and executed. So now this clash between these two classes has degenerated into a personal clash between Nathaniel Bacon on the one hand and William Berkeley on the other hand. Now, Berkeley, excuse me, uh, Nathaniel Bacon decides my success rests with the cause of the freedmen and the current indentured servants. So what Nathaniel Bacon does is he says, I'm going to raise an army and I'm going to specifically appeal to these freedmen and the indentured servants. He says, if you join me in my army, I will promise you first, I will give the indentured servants, I'll give all of you guys your freedom. You'll all be freedmen and then I'll let you take anybody's land you want. You can have all of the land you want. You can have anyone's land that you want. So what Bacon winds up doing here is starting a rebellion against the colonial government in Virginia, against William Berkeley's regime. Now, William Berkeley is terrified of this whole thing, especially when Berkeley's army makes it to the uh, capital of the Virginia colony at this time, uh, colonial uh, or the colonial capital, Williamsburg. They get to get uh, they get to Williamsburg. They burn the place to the ground, and it's done. And Berkeley is terrified and gets on a ship, leaves Virginia, and sends very quick letters back home to England, appealing to the government in England to send naval forces to stop this rebellion against the colony of Virginia. Okay, against the colony of Virginia. Bacon's grievance. I'm going to repeat this, just in case it wasn't clear. Bacon's grievance is solely with William Berkeley. He has no gripe with the government. In fact, he believes that the person who's acting illegally against the interests of England is William Berkeley. So don't get trapped here into thinking that this rebellion is some sort of big freedom movement. It's all about Bacon versus Berkeley and who's going to be in control in Virginia. Now, this rebellion seems to be going fairly well for Bacon and his rebels, but as these things wind up going, this one kind of falls apart very quickly. Bacon wound up contracting dysentery while out campaigning and fighting against William Berkeley and his supporters. And Bacon's rebellion was almost a matter of, it's a rebellion that's a matter of personality. Without Nathaniel Bacon in up front and leading the fight, 
this rebellion just doesn't have the the uh, the same appeal. So when Bacon dies, essentially the rebellion dies. And when Bacon dies, William Berkeley feels it's safe enough to come back home to Virginia, which he does, and he orders the arrests of all of these people who were involved in Bacon's rebellion. He puts a number of them on trial. But there's a bigger fallout than the trial and uh, a lot of Bacon's cohort being arrested and executed. The incident scared Virginia's elite. They now said it's not a possibility of what happens if the underclass rises up and tries to overthrow us. We've seen it. It can happen. So we got to do something to make sure this never, ever happens again. But here's their problem. They look at the wrong part of this thing. They get the wrong solution because they look at this incorrectly. They looked at this and said the reason the rebellion happened in the first place is because we did not lock down our labor force. Our labor force knew that if if they made it through their term of indenture, they'll be free. And we told them, if you're free, you can own land, you can do all of these sorts of things, just like we do. We own land, we can do things like chart the course of our own future, we make our decisions. If you live through your term of indenture, you'll be, quote, just like us. You'll be as free as us. You'll have as much, quote, liberty as us. And that was a problem. They didn't want these people to be just like them. They didn't count on these people being just like them. So what they looked at, they said, okay, the problem is, is that we gave our labor force hope. What we've got to do is strangle that hope. We've got to make sure that our labor class knows going forward that they will never be anything but the labor class. They will never be anything but the lowest class in society. We've got to take that hope of freedom away from them. So their solution is to transform labor, to put in place a system of labor where the laborer does not expect freedom. Not that they can't get it by running away or by otherwise, quote, freeing themselves, but a system where they cannot reasonably expect freedom at the end. So that group of laborers is slaves. So when we return in the next class, I'll talk a little bit about how this system, what this system uh, means, how it gets implemented, uh, and then we'll move on to the Massachusetts and uh, uh, New England part of colonizations. See you for lecture number five.